Okay, I've done quite a bit of work with rural education. A lot of my research has been looking specifically at students in rural areas. Uh, and I'm also very interested in reading. Um, one of my childhood dreams was to start my own library and I would go to garage sales and uh, get lots of books. And uh, so I'm gonna take a look at the relationship between, or whether or not there is a relationship between locale that a student grows up in and whether or not they have over 50 books in their household, which is a, a yes or no question. Um, so I'm going to put that here, and in this case, um, it doesn't really matter what your columns and rows are, unlike a lot of the tests that we've run. Uh, I do want to make sure that I have observed and expected there, and um, make sure that I'm doing the chi-square and the phi and Kramer's V. Uh, incidentally, you can call this phi, uh, which would be more like the original Greek pronunciation, or phi is the more uh, westernized American current version. Um, so either, either one is, is fine there. And make sure that you are, so this was not on the other video, the, you do want to get some visual of what's going on here. So click that, and that should give you your output. So now I'm just going to bring all this output over into my lab. Okay, I've now pasted all the output and um, have completed the steps, but I just wanted to make some, some comments here. So step one, you're just talking about the interest level in these two variables. Step two, you're just formalizing that into a research question. Uh, and step three, you're looking at the bars. Do be careful. Um, notice that we're, we have counts here, not proportions which means if, if I just looked at the fact that this green, green is a suburban in my case, if I just looked at that green bar, I might say, well, the suburban students have, uh, are much more likely to have over 50 books, which is what this one represents. Um, that uh, does turn out to be true, as a matter of fact, but we can't tell it just because this bar is higher, uh, because notice that the green bar is also higher in the condition uh, students who didn't have over 50 books. Um, so what really matters here is the, the relative proportions, and, and that all comes out in the cross tabs table. Uh, so step three, you're just giving a real quick visual inspection. Um, your conclusions here will not be definite. This is more just a, a first glance. Do you notice anything interesting there? Um, for the actual chi-squared test, the null hypothesis is always going to be that there's no relationship between the two variables, and the alternative would be that there is a relationship. Um, we're going to conduct this at 0 0.05 level of significance. Your, all of your variables uh, for this particular study should meet the, the assumption of the multinomial random variables. It's Again, it's not simple random sample, but it, it was very close. It was certainly a random, proportional random sample. Uh, and we've already screened out the missing data. So everyone's going to have exactly one response in one of your categories. Uh, and double check, so for this second assumption, we are looking right here below the chi-squared test. Uh, but I would think with the, <clears throat> excuse me, the size of this sample, Unless you chose a variable with a lot of categories, um, you should have that. Even if you don't meet this assumption, go ahead and continue the test, but do be sure that you write, write what your minimum cell count was. For degrees of freedom, um, when I say 2 by 3 contingency table, what I mean is this cross tabs, it had two different values on this variable and three on this, so that gives us our two by three. Um, to find the degrees of freedom, you would just subtract one of the, uh, you can almost think of it coloring it out with a marker, knock out one of the rows, and then knock out one of the columns. Um, ignore the total altogether for, this, for the purposes of this, and the remaining number of cells is your degrees of freedom. So, for me, I have this two by three table. I'm knocking out an entire row, knocking out an entire column, and that would give me a degree of freedom of two. Um, 
if you're curious where that comes from, if you picture, let's say we had these totals in here already, um, the question is, how many of these six cells would be we be free to fill out with any number before we would kind of be constrained by the totals on what to fill in. So if you think about filling in this and this, by the time you fill in this, if I have the total, I could also get this. Uh, if I had this, I could get this. If I had these totals, I could get this. So don't, don't worry about that too much, other than that's where that degree of freedom concept comes from. Uh, so if I go to the critical values, table H here, I'm looking at, um, we set a 0 0.05 level of significance, and because I have two degrees of freedom, my, my critical value is going to be 5.991. Uh, yours, for example, if you had a 2 by 2 table, would be less than that, or it might be more. It should be in this column if you're using the same level of significance as me. And to just get a visual of what that is, um, so this chi-squared distribution uh, looks slightly different than the standard normal uh, distribution. You can see this this long right skew. Um, the critical value is going to be set somewhere, and then if we would get uh, our test statistic, our chi-squared test statistic would be beyond that, would be above whatever our critical value is, we'd be out in what's called the rejection region. We're far enough away uh, from this null hypothesis of zero that we think there probably is a relationship between the two variables. Um, and then my p-value I'm getting from this Pearson chi-squared, the asymptotic significance, uh, that would be the p-value right there. And again, it's never really zero, uh, but if, if you have three zeros, we just say it's less than 0 0.001. Um, so we put that there in step D. Uh, e then my chi-squared statistics, again, I'm getting that from the Pearson chi-squared test. There's the value of my test statistic, which is well beyond that uh, critical value from D, part D there. So because of that, I'm out in the rejection region, oops, and I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. So I have statistical significance, statistically significant. Now that's not everything, which we'll get to here in, in part G. Uh, just as a backup, and, and these should never disagree, but uh, just to show you how they line up, I can also look at my p-value from, from part D and see that that's below that alpha level of significance of 0 0.05. Uh, as with any time when you reject the null hypothesis in any, any of these uh, hypothesis tests, it's possible that I'm making a type 1 error. It's, it's possible that there really isn't a difference between, or that there really isn't any association between these two variables and I just happened to get a sample that was very extreme, but, but that chance is very small. So in plain English, our data do suggest there's a relationship between the locale in which a student attends high school and the likelihood they grew up in a home with over 50 books. This, this conclusion can follow pretty closely to um, your, your wording in step A, depending on whether or not you uh, rejected your null or you failed to reject your null. Um, it, well, I, I should be, if you failed to reject your null, you shouldn't say that there is no relationship. You should say that your data uh, were not suggestive of a relationship or based on your data, you were not able to find a relationship. We don't, we certainly didn't prove in any sense that there is no relationship. So do be careful. Uh, if you failed to reject, just say that you basically weren't able to reject. It doesn't mean that you accept this null hypothesis. And finally, uh, we're looking at the cross tabs here. Uh, this is, I guess, in some ways, the most important part of the whole thing. We're looking at uh, what was expected based on, when we say expected, we mean if the null hypothesis had been true. If, if there really was no relationship between locale and whether or not a student was likely to have over 50 books, then these are the numbers that we should see. For example, in urban areas, 
we should see that given this number of urban students that 3,570, two of them uh, should have had over 50 books. And the, the actual number there, 3,491 was much smaller. So fewer urban students than expected had had over 50 books in their house. The situation was very different for suburban students. So if there had been no relationship between locale and, and the number of books in the house, uh, we would have expected the suburban students who notice there's many more of them than, than the other two groups. Uh, but this accounts for that. What we're looking at here now accounts for those differences. So the fact that this uh, number is higher um, is based on the fact that there's more suburban students in the sample. It's not going to throw off the relationship between what we actually saw and what we expected. So we expected or would expect 5,360 and we saw about 80 more students than expected had over 50 books in their house, suggesting there's that relationship that suburban students were more likely to have over 50 books in their house. Uh, for rural students, they also were, this was a little surprise to me, uh, we would have expected 2,055 of them to have over 50 books and actually 2,057. So it's, it's virtually no difference. Um, but the tiny, tiny, almost imperceptible difference there is, is that there were slightly more rural students than expected had over 50 books in their house. So really it was just that urban category who had much fewer, much fewer of the students, um, had 50, 50 books in their house than expected. Uh, so that's what, that's what I'm writing here at the first part of G. Uh, and then I'm looking for that, that effect size, uh, that Kramer's V. So if I go up here, I see that my Kramer's V, and this is because I had higher than a 2.2. If I had had a 2.2, uh, two by two table, I would have looked right here. Although with this sample size, they were, they were identical. Um, my Kramer's V was 0 0.035. And if you go to the site that I listed there, Again, these are very, very rough guidelines. I'm looking at two degrees of freedom. Uh, my 0 0.035 didn't even meet that that kind of threshold for a small significance. So we're we're talking about tiny, almost imperceptible difference, e even though it was statistically significant. So just to drive that point home, even though my p-value was tiny, and I'm I'm very convinced that there is an association, um, I, need to, I need to put in the caveat that, that that association that I'm pretty sure about or that I'm very sure about is tiny. So in practical terms, it really doesn't matter that much.